Hello, I'm Dr. DeBellis. I hope you've been enjoying these presentations. This is going to be our last presentation for the semester. We're going to talk about schizophrenia. Below is a Rorschach slide uh, or template or plate. Um, the Rorschach is actually an interesting tool because there have been a lot of problems with the Rorschach, but one of the useful things about the Rorschach, it can be very useful for, for diagnosing psychosis. And uh, one of the reasons that it has endured in, uh, in, in the testing domain of clinical psychology is because of that. Um, but we're going to talk about schizophrenia. We're, first, we're going to talk about what the characteristics of schizophrenia are. Then I'd like to talk to you about the etiology as well as preclinical models of schizophrenia, and neurochemical models as well. And then we're going to revisit the idea of neuroleptics and atypical antipsychotics and their efficacy for treating schizophrenia. So schizophrenia is a disorder that has a long history. Initially, it was noted that people with schizophrenia had the Argyle Robinson pupil, and uh, as a result, their pupils would not constrict properly. Um, but eventually, with the discovery of um, antibiotics, um, it was discovered that some of these cases of schizophrenia were treatable. They were actually Tabes dorsalis, which is late-stage syphilis. That was one of the, the biggest discoveries in psychiatry, penicillin being used to treat Tabes dorsalis. These people were actually able to be treated, were be able to be helped. Um, but there's still a whole group of people with schizophrenia that continued to endure. People with schizophrenia were oftentimes not treated very well, and we're going to talk about that in more detail. Um, we're also going to talk about the prefrontal lobotomy, which is actually a procedure that sometimes was used um, in the treatment. But mental disorders called psychoses are characterized by severe distortions of reality and disturbances in perception, intellectual functioning, affect and motivation, as well as social relationships and motor behavior. Individuals with schizophrenia have many symptoms, <clears throat> including hearing voices, holding unrealistic ideas and beliefs, and communicating in a way that's difficult to understand. Um, they're frequently so incapacitated that voluntary or involuntary hospitalization is required. And although the symptoms can be somewhat controlled, schizophrenia at this time cannot be cured or prevented. So the symptoms most often begin during the late teenage years and the early 20s, but there are gender differences. Um, after the age 36, more women than men experience the first episode. One of the reasons that schizophrenia is so hard for me personally to diagnose is because I know it carries quite a stigma. Oftentimes, the people who I'm diagnosing are in their early 20s or their late teens. Therefore, I know that it's probably my diagnosis is probably going to have quite an impact on the sorts of educational and vocational opportunities they're going to have. So I'm very thoughtful about how I, how I approach this because there's a, a lot of uh, potential risk for error and uh, hurting the patient by diagnosing them if you're wrong. <clears throat> so it's very difficult to do. But as we can see, between the ages of 16 and 25, more men are diagnosed, whereas um, over the age of 50, uh, of, uh, let me see here, 36, we find more women are diagnosed than, than men. So it's an interesting trend that we see. However, I do want to point out that typically schizophrenia is not really diagnosed uh, later in life. Oftentimes, if something like schizophrenia presents, if somebody is having delusions or hallucinations, oftentimes neuro neurologists will actually explore for other um, conditions that can actually have similar symptoms, such as Lewy body disease, or sometimes people can actually have hallucinations because of delirium. 
caused by drugs, alcohol-related issues, um, metabolic changes, sepsis. Now, schizophrenia is a thought disorder. <coughs> it's characterized by logical thinking, lack of reasoning, and inability to recognize reality. And the specific symptoms show a great deal of individual variation. Auditory hallucinations are frequent and are usually voices that are insulting or commanding the individual to do certain things. But bizarre delusions are also common, especially uh, delusions of persecution involving the individual's belief that others are spying on or planning on harming the individual. Um, also common are delusions that thoughts are broadcast from one's head to the world or that thoughts are imposed from an outside source such as outer space. But communications confused and illogical and often does not follow the rules uh, of semantics. Speech may be vague or repetitive or shift from one subject to another. And emotions may be absent or, or totally inappropriate to the situation. And sudden and unpredictable changes of emotion are also common. So people are frequently withdrawn and preoccupied with extreme apathy. And an inability to initiate activities often means there's no interest in everyday activities, such as hygiene. And this can cause further isolation because of their poor hygiene. Many cognitive deficits impair the ability to function at school or in jobs. Um, and motor activities reduced and characterized by inappropriate or bizarre postures, rigidity, purposeless and stereotyped movements such as rocking and pacing. And at times people with schizophrenia, particularly people with paranoid schizophrenia, can get quite agitated and violent. If we're trying to figure out which symptoms and disorders have the strongest correlation with violence, um, delusions, uh, grandiose delusions, delusions of persecution, uh, hallucinations or some of them. The catch is we have to be very, very thoughtful about who we share that information with because the overwhelming majority of people with schizophrenia are not violent and we don't want to stigmatize them. So oftentimes when somebody points out that certain schizophrenic symptoms are actually um, associated with a slight elevation risk for violence, it's pointed out that it's a very, 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 very slight risk. We don't want to pathologize them and create more fear in the general public by pretending that it's a really significant relationship. So historically, schizophrenia has been organized into subtypes catatonic, paranoid, disorganized, and undifferentiated. So catatonic schizophrenia consists of alternating periods of immobility and excited agitation. Sometimes they won't move, they'll sit still. It, it almost seems like they're unresponsive to the world around them. Then they can actually pace back and forth, up and down a, a hallway, oftentimes medications given to control the agitation, neuroleptic medication. <coughs> now, paranoid schizophrenia is characterized by delusions of grandeur or persecution. These individuals uh, will believe they have supernatural powers. They'll start thinking that they're capable of doing things that are impossible. Or they'll start believing that everyone's out to get them. They'll see somebody, uh, for instance, uh, walks by them and they'll think the person might potentially be uh, preparing to do something to them. We also have disorganized, which is uh, really silly, immature emotions with really disorganized behavior. These person, people will joke around about really inappropriate things. Um, and then finally, undifferentiated schizophrenia is cases not meeting the criteria of the other subtypes. Another classification scheme is based on symptoms. We have positive symptoms, which are delusions and hallucinations and bizarre behavior. Um, patients tend to be older at first onset um, and respond well to conventional antipsychotics that block 
or antagonize dopamine 2 receptors. All the really effective neuroleptic or antipsychotic drugs seem like they preferentially antagonize these dopamine 2 receptors. Um, but positive symptoms are things that are acquired when somebody has a psychotic break, such as they begin having hallucinations, they begin having delusions, they begin to become agitated. These are positive symptoms. Negative symptoms are things that are lost when somebody has a psychotic break. So a negative symptom is like a decline in normal function, reduced speech, flattened affect, loss of motivation, they quit going to work, they quit going to school, social withdrawal, as well as anhedonia, which is a lack of interest in any hobbies. <coughs> and these, dis these symptoms are easily mistaken for other disorders, such as depression. Keep in mind, in depression, anhedonia <coughs> is one of the hallmark symptoms. That and sadness are the two major symptoms, as well as um, some of these other uh, patterns, such as social withdrawal. The third class of symptoms, so we have positive and negative symptoms, the third class is cognitive symptoms. And it consists of impaired working memory, executive functioning, and attention. And negative and cognitive symptoms are the most resistant to antipsychotic drugs. And patients tend to show early onset in a long course of progressive deterioration. Before drug therapy, patients were confined to mental hospitals where treatment was limited to isolation or restraint shock therapy, using insulin-induced seizures or electrical currents, and a surgery known as the prefrontal lobotomy. The prefrontal lobotomy, um, I talked about penicillin being one of the great victories in psychiatry. The prefrontal lobotomy is actually one of the greatest failures in psychiatry. <coughs> it was noticed there were these two uh, chimpanzees named Becky and Lucy. It was noticed that when they ablated the prefrontal cortices, um, okay, it was noticed earlier than these two chimpanzees that if you ablate or remove the prefrontal areas of rats, they become more docile. Eventually, this was done with two chimpanzees, Becky and Lucy, who um, were known for being especially aggressive, difficult to handle. After they had their prefrontal cortices ablated, they became very docile, and in the words of the researchers, they became a pleasure to work with. When this was uh, discussed at a presentation, a man named Agamonis asked if this procedure had ever been done with human beings. The normal reaction would be whiskey tango foxtrot, like, what do you mean, remove their prefrontal cortex to calm them down? Um, eventually, this procedure was being done with human beings. The original procedure was actually called a leucotomy. Um, it became more aggressive and became what's formally known as the lobotomy. We have some really sad stories about the results of the lobotomy. There was a young man named Howard Tooley, who was actually a resident of the East Bay. He lost his mother when he was young. His father remarried. His stepmother took him to a psychiatrist because he was doing things that bothered her. For instance, sometimes he didn't want to do his schoolwork or he didn't want to go to church or he wouldn't get ready quick enough. Um, so she took him to a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist said, this is an adolescent boy. This is what they do. Unfortunately, he'll be all right. She didn't like that feedback. Um, maybe she was a humanist, right? I, the patient always knows best. Um, okay, bad joke. So she ended up going to six more um, uh, psychiatrists. And the first Five of them said, yeah, this is absolutely true, that, you know, this, this young boy is just a young boy. That's what they do, you know. It doesn't mean he's a demon because sometimes they don't want to go to church on Sunday morning. Um, eventually, the final psychiatrist she found, I think it was lucky number seven, um, he said, you know, this does sound pretty serious. I think we need to do a lobotomy. Poor Howard Tooley. What they do in a lobotomy procedure is they pull out the upper eyelid, and they actually tap 
a, a tool up through the orbit of the skull into the prefrontal cortex and they wiggle it around disconnecting the prefrontal cortex. Howard Dooley actually wrote a book many decades later called My Lobotomy where he describes how he became a zombie after this procedure. Really horrible experience. Agamonis went on to get the Nobel Prize. I think he shared the Nobel Prize in medicine for the prefrontal lobotomy um, before being killed by a lobotomy patient, interestingly. Um, but antipsychotic drugs came along. And at that time, antipsychotic drugs were the best thing for people with psychosis because people with psychosis would be put into... Um, mental asylums where they would actually be sometimes tortured, mistreated, um, and they wouldn't be able to see their families. They would end up being traumatized. But when antipsychotic drugs came about, these individuals could actually be released from these hospitals and they could actually live with their families. That's really important. That's a really great thing for them, um, especially when you consider in, in some cultures Having the entire family together is sort of the, uh, the lifeblood of the, the culture. They're very tight-knit. They want the families around. So in communal cultures, for instance, it would be very important, even if they were on medication, that they would be with the family. Um, so the number of patients hospitalized dropped with the introduction of chlorpromazine, which is called Thorazine. And this drug calmed the excited patient and activated the patient who was profoundly withdrawn. Um, many modifications of chlorpromazine have been made, and the development of new compounds continues today. We've got dozens and dozens of different ones. <coughs> now, recent advances in technology have revealed abnormalities of brain structure and function in individuals with schizophrenia. Um, so, before we proceed, I want to point out there's a difference between structure and function. Um, I call this the goodwill phenomenon. If you go into goodwill, some items are all beat up. You look at them and you can tell they don't work. Hopefully you don't see many of those items because they never make it on the shelves. But every once in a while, you find yourself that DeLonghi espresso maker that looks beautiful, perfectly polished, it looks like somebody took good care of it, you give them your three dollars, you go home with this beautiful piece of machinery and it doesn't work. Okay, so if this hasn't happened to you, that's good. Um, at some point, you know, your, your spouse will explain to you, you know, something, you keep bringing home these nice appliances thinking they'll work just because they're shiny and intact, but just because it's structurally sound does not mean it's functionally sound. If this $2,000 espresso maker really worked, it wouldn't be at the Goodwill for four months. Um, so there's a difference between structure and function. Now, we would expect that either of those would be impaired, would be impaired in somebody with schizophrenia, and we would expect what lobe of the brain do you think that the dysfunction would be in? Well, they have trouble with judgment. They have trouble with social interaction. They have trouble with movement. To me, that spells out frontal cortex. Many studies show cerebral atrophy and enlargement of fluid-filled ventricles following cell loss. So on the left, we can actually see, um, we can see the ventricles, those hollowed out areas in the center of the brain, and a normal individual. These are identical twins, by the way. The one on the left is normal. The one on the right has schizophrenia. Look at these enlarged ventricles here. Look how big they are. These are fluid filled. Cerebral spinal fluid is inside there. And look how big all these ventricles are. So this right here, these are the lateral ventricles. Right here we have the third ventricle. Can't really see the fourth ventricle as much, but <clears throat> it would be down here. The big thing is these lateral ventricles are huge. Whenever we see enlarged lateral ventricles like that, there's one of two conditions we typically think of, hydrocephalus and schizophrenia. In the case of hydrocephalus, an accumulation of pressure in the ventricles causes an effacement on the outside where it presses the um, 
cortex against the skull. In this case, there's not that effacement, that flattening. It's not pressure inside the brain. It's actually a loss of brain matter that leads to this atrophy. We call this ventriculomegaly, if you look at a neurology um, medical chart. <coughs> so studies also show hippocampal cells of patients with schizophrenia are more disorganized than those of healthy subjects. And selected cortical la layers are actually atrophied. So many brain areas show shrinking of dendritic trees that would lead to connectivity failures. Here we can actually see pictures. Look over here. Look how disorganized these pyramidal cells are. Um, over here, this looks like the Costco parking lot, right? They point in every which direction. Over here, look at that. That's the Apple Store. That's Disneyland. They're nicely organized. They're oriented in the same direction. That's what this artistic rendering is supposed to show. Here we have this, this Lego box of disorganized but here we have this nice, neatly streamlined uh, pattern. You can see here with these dendrites how disorganized they are, but the pyramidal cells here in, in the hippocampus in particular are nice and neatly arranged in the normal control. Now, brain changes may be due to progressive deterioration during the illness rather than causing the illness. And one of the theories is antipsychotic medications are given to cool down the extent of the fire. Or it may be due to the effects of antipsychotic medication use over many years. Being on antipsychotic medications over a long period of time can actually affect your brain and your body. They're the lesser evil. If somebody's at a high risk for injuring themselves or for having difficulty having relationships with other people, sometimes it's a trade-off. Um, to get them on medications that do have many side effects. <clears throat> but most brain changes are not correlated with duration of time since the onset of symptoms and the duration of time since hospitalization. Therefore, it doesn't seem like it's caused primarily by the antipsychotic medication. Now, functional changes include redu reduced function in the prefrontal cortex called hypofrontality. So here we see the prefrontal cortex is not atrophied. However, it doesn't function as much. Reduced blood flow is associated with less glucose use, which indicates how active the brain cells are. Some, sometimes brains only shift into first gear, but sometimes they shift into fifth gear, which means that they're consuming great quantities of uh, glucose. And we can actually use... Um, positron emission tomography, PET scans, to actually measure what parts of the brain are shifting into fifth gear, which ones are shifting into first gear, which ones are not able to shift past second gear. Imaging studies show less blood flow to the frontal cortex when people with schizophrenia are performing cognitive tasks, such as the Wisconsin card sorting test. The Wisconsin card sorting test is one of the the best tests of dorsolateral prefrontal lobe functioning. Um, it consists of a task in which an individual is given a deck of cards and they have to sort them. Here we see the individual has a card with one green cross and he has to determine whether it goes with four yellow crosses, one red star, two green triangles, or three blue circles. So he has to determine, how do I sort? Do I sort by color, shape, number? Now he's not given any clues. All he's told is whether he's right or wrong. He's, the test administrator is kind of like a really shitty boss. They'll always tell you if you did a bad job, but they'll never give you any constructive feedback. They'll just say bad job. It's kind of what you have to do on this test. You either say wrong or right. So if he sorts that green cross with the green triangles, I would say right. And he figures out, oh, sorting by color. Now, if he sorts the green cross with the red star, and I say wrong, he should be able to figure out, okay, we're not sorting by number. So now I'm going to move to color or shape. When an individual has schizophrenia, this is very difficult for them to figure out how to sort, to actually engage in visual problem solving 
And whenever you shift the um, way that they're supposed to sort them, they perseverate on a previously correct pattern, which interferes with their ability to learn, to adapt, to proficiently learn how to sort the cards. Um, now, if you give a normal person this task and you measure glucose metabolism in their brain, what you'll notice is in the top two are the left and right hemisphere of a normal person. Look at this red here. That's the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex right here. These individuals, whenever they're doing this task, their dorsolateral prefrontal cortex goes into full force. It just starts working its hardest because this is an executive functioning problem solving task. An individual with schizophrenia, on the other hand, they don't have that increase in brain metabolism that's in the prefrontal cortex. Therefore, um, we can assume it's like their prefrontal cortex is not able to shift past third gear. And uh, so this is the hypofrontality hypothesis. We're seeing it here on, on brain imaging. So, oh, there we go. That's during the card sorting, as you can see. Individual with... Uh, yeah, who's doing the task has this increase in prefrontal lobe functioning, especially dorsolateral. But look here with schizophrenia, you don't find this increase. So there's not that increase in activity. So this is that hypofrontality hypothesis. And it's especially interesting because the negative and cognitive symptoms of schizophrenia resemble the deficit seen following the surgical disconnection of the frontal lobes, the prefrontal lobotomy, yes. If you read through Howard Dooley's book, you see that what he's describing, it's almost like he became schizophrenic whenever this procedure happened. He was withdrawn. He couldn't interact with people. He had a great deal of avolition, lack of motivation. Now, some markers are potentially useful in diagnosing schizophrenia. And right now, that's what we're looking for, is we're looking for biomarkers for disorders. We want to figure out if somebody has it before they you know, make a bad judgment that results in some kind of a legal issue. Eye movement dysfunction, such as inability to visually track an object, has been a useful biomarker thus far. Failure to track is also common in relatives of schizophrenic patients, and the defective eye tracking gene may be inherited along with the genes for schizophrenia. Um, now, the EEG... Um, of a healthy person shows localized stimulus-induced electrical activity in a specific area of the brain, depending on the nature of the stimulus. And persons with schizophrenia respond to specific stimuli with widespread electrical activity across large portions of the brain. Now, although schizophrenia is an ancient disorder described as early as 1000 BC, its causes remain unknown. It's uh, increasingly regarded as a neurodevelopmental disorder with a strong genetic component. And the importance of genetics is shown by many family, twin, and adoption studies. You probably remember family studies um, were attempts to talk to families about, hey, does anybody in your family have depression or do they have schizophrenia? They're not real reliable because sometimes the relatives will embellish the uniqueness of certain family members, you know, the, 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 uh, the black sheep of the family gets all of their idiosyncrasies exaggerated. Uh, it's not as reliable as twin studies, where you look at two twins, identical twins who live in a family. But if you find that twins that live together are similar, you can always make the argument it has more to do with the similar upbringing than their genetic makeups that they share. Adoption studies are the gold standard. Adoption studies involve monozygotic twins who were adopted by different families and raised in different environments because we can control for the effects of shared environment by putting them in different environments and then they, um, we can see how similar they are. And these adoption studies reveal, um, so data summarized from 40 studies show that the risk of having schizophrenia varies according to how many genes one shares with someone with a disorder. 
And other factors must be involved as well. So if genes were totally responsible, the concordance rate for identical twins would be 100%, like it is in Huntington's disease. But we find for monozygotic twins, we find that it's actually 48%. Um, but for dizygotic twins, it's only 17%. <coughs> so if you have been diagnosed with schizophrenia, formally diagnosed, um, if you have an identical twin, there's almost a 50% chance your identical twin will also have it. So that points to the role of genetics, but still the, the heritability of schizophrenia is still lower than major depressive disorder, ADHD, Huntington's disease, uh, many personality disorders. So it's not entirely genetic. So there seem to be environmental factors. But genetic research tries to identify the genes that predict vulnerability to allow early intervention. And it's difficult because many genes are involved. Some potential genes have been identified by linkage studies. And linkage studies, if you recall, we look for similarities at the low key in families with the affected members. Um, but the genes suspected to be involved um, include, there's a genetic correlate of characteristics typical of schizophrenia, such as an eye tracking dysfunction, the alleles involved in neurotransmitters and receptors, as well as genes, uh, gene mutations that affect brain development. But new DNA techniques such as DNA microarrays, genome-wide association screening, um, these techniques allow rapid screening of large amounts of genetic data, and hopefully these will be useful so we can have a better understanding of who is at a greater risk for developing schizophrenia. But the alleles found more often in people with schizophrenia are associated with the disorder and singled out for further research. Lots of problems with this. We still have a long ways to go. It's unlikely a single gene will be identified that makes a large contribution to susceptibility to schizophrenia. And it's more likely there will be large numbers of genetic variants that each contributes only a small amount. And also keep in mind, we're talking about genotype. There's also phenotype. Keep in mind, genotype is like the recipe for a cake. Phenotype is how it tastes. And then we have to look at that in culture. Um, so <clears throat> just because somebody has a certain genotype doesn't mean that it's going to express itself. Epigenetic changes also play a role. I shouldn't say may also play a role, does play a role. That's why we didn't see a 100% concordance rate for schizophrenia. Stress, especially early in life, produces epigenetic modifications which alter neurodevelopment. Um, Relin's uh, glycoprotein, for instance, secreted by neurons, and it guides neuron positioning during fetal brain development. It seems like Relin may play a role in, in the complex interaction that we're seeing. Um, reduction of Relin could explain the cell disorganization, the morphological abnormalities in schizophrenic brains, as well as uh, um, we find it's reduced in adults and may contribute to cognitive deficits and uh, reduced, reduced relin expressions uh, due to epigenetic modulation of the relin gene. But I, I want to point out to you, we have to be really careful um, when we talk about epigenetics and environmental factors because there's a really nasty history of blaming parents for schizophrenia. In the words of Robin Williams, if you can't blame it on one thing, then blame it on the mother. Um, uh, unfortunately, this has happened. We've had this recycling of the schizophrenogenic mother hypothesis, which is that if somebody has schizophrenia, that the parenting strategies were probably lousy. This was beat down. We understand that being a bad parent doesn't cause um, schizophrenia. I mean, Come on, like, think of how many shitty parents there are in the world. Like, if bad parenting caused schizophrenia, schizophrenia would be like a quarter of the population, right? So this theory was abandoned. Um, eventually it reemerged again. Its most recent, recent reemergence was actually the uh, 
double bind theory out, out of Palo Alto, which is the idea that if um, you get put placed in a double bind, which is a situation in which you're damned if you do, damned if you don't, that this will lead you to develop schizophrenia. So the idea that if your parents say, you know, if you don't get into Stanford, you're going to destroy us. We'll lose the will to live. We will die feeling like failures. But if they also tell you, if you ever leave rural Tennessee, we will be devastated. We will not be able to live. We will lose the will. It's like, okay, well, what, what's my option here? I can't have Stanford, like, moved to rural Tennessee. That's not a practical thing for me to to do before going to to, to school. So um, many of us know what it feels like to be placed in double binds and uh, um, fortunately the evidence does not suggest that that typically causes schizophrenia. Um, some people do still hold these views. Um, we call them the old guard of diagnosis. Um, now, mutations of the DISC C1 gene um, may contribute to risk of schizophrenia, and it codes for proteins essential in neural development, and it can be disrupted by a chromosome translocation. So, the DISC C1 polymorphisms are also associated with impaired cognitive function which again is something we find in schizophrenia. Many investigators now believe that genetic vulnerability increases the probability that events during perinatal brain development will contribute to the occurrence of schizophrenia. And there's a high occurrence of perinatal complications among individuals with schizophrenia. Um, it's higher than, than in the general population. And these complications include brain insult during pregnancy or delivery. And this can be related to oxygen deprivation, drug use, infection, endocrine disorders, severe malnutrition, exposure to viral infection, uh, such as measles. And this is uh, typically in the second trimester that this happens. Now, some behaviors in early infancy signal potential risk, such as passivity and apathy reduced responsiveness to verbal commands, more difficult temperament, poor sensory motor performance. Um, oftentimes I, I would see that individuals I diagnosed with schizophrenia when I worked with the homeless population had a really poor sensory motor performance. And um, I, some of that could also be related to other factors, but it does seem like motor disturbance is characteristic of schizophrenia, eye movements, um, limb movements, um, there's actually somebody named Elaine Walker who has a theory about how uh, you can look at posture and walking and you can actually figure out who has schizophrenia by looking at the way they walk. But during adolescence, a period of significant brain development, excessive synaptic pruning can result in loss of cortical gray matter. And here we have the areas where this occurs. So in uh, adolescence with schizophrenia, it, it appears that in these areas in the very top, um, in, this, in the motor and sensory cortices, as well as down in the temporal poles, these individuals seem like uh, they, uh, there's, there's this pruning process that occurs there. Um, but we have the early stage factors, such as genetic predisposition and environmental insults. And then the neurodevelopmental abnormalities, it's also possible there's a latent stage where the early subtle signs predicting schizophrenia um, are seen, such as social withdrawal, deficits in attention and information processing. And then finally, the late stage is this excessive synaptic pruning, uh, stress substance use, which is not uncommon for people with schizophrenia to use substances, and there's an ongoing debate upon whether the substances cause the psychosis or the psychosis increases the likelihood of substance abuse. But then these lead to greater impairments in cognitive function, including deficits in attention, memory, executive functions, worsening of negative symptoms, uh, such as anhedonia, isolation, 
Now, no single animal model can mimic the complex symptoms of schizophrenia. We have uh, animal models for things like depression, right? We have the uh, Flanders mice, I think they're called, that develop uh, depression. We do not have these for schizophrenia. Um, um, each one focus, each uh, animal model focuses on one aspect of the disorder to experimentally induce similar changes in animal behavior. Um, and these are used to test potential new drugs. They often depend on neurochemically induced behaviors known to respond to current useful drugs. And this method often fails to identify drugs with novel mechanisms of action. Um, <laughs> some, I was told by one of the psychiatrists that I work with that um, certain antipsychotic medications were being marketed as being um, higher in efficacy for certain types of delusions, like um, erotomanic delusions, delusions of persecution versus uh, uh, delusions of grandeur. Um, however, the, it didn't seem like certain ones were more useful for certain delusions. Um, now, the amphetamine-induced stereotype is when high doses of stimulants, such as amphetamine, mimic schizophrenia, particularly paranoid schizophrenia. There's a really interesting book called Whispers, the Voices of Paranoia by Ronald Siegel that basically goes through cases where this occurs, where people use too much stimulant medication and what happens. Uh, many of the stories in that book have now been uh, turned into um, Hollywood movies. I, I believe that, the, that it was the origin, for instance, for the movie Bugs, as well as uh, Black Swan and a few other movies. But in animals, it produces characteristic stereotypes, sniffing, licking, gnawing, and uh, the stereotype behavior also occurs in humans on high doses and is similar to the compulsive repetitions of behavior that we, we see in schizophrenia. And this method has been used for years to identify potential antipsychotic drugs. Now, another method compares dose response curves for a drug's ability to block hyperactivity induced by apomorphine. Um, you might remember this is a dopamine agonist. And uh, they look at these dose response curves. Um, with the curve for the drug's effectiveness in producing catalepsy, which again is this failure to move. And greater separation between curves means less likelihood the effective antipsychotic dose will produce motor side effects in humans. These motor side effects are really problematic. So here we can actually see what the blockade, what the um, response curve would be. I'm sorry, I skipped over that right there. So we can actually see what the difference is. We can see what the safe dose is going to be for um, administering the dose. Uh, this, this would be kind of the effective dose. Uh, we can see it's it's much greater, for instance, from ramoxapride. Um, therefore, that's going to probably be more useful. It's going to be less likely to lead to these motor symptoms. Um, we can test this in animals. Animals' limbs are placed into separate holes and time uh, need to remove uh, foreign hind paws is recorded. It's called the paw test. And the striatum, which is, is a part of the basal ganglia, regulates four paw retraction. And this is an analog for motor side effects. And the nucleus accumens regulates rear paw reaction. Um, and longer drug-induced reaction times correlate with the therapeutic efficacy. So... Now, the rodent version of Wisconsin card sorting test, because the, the cards are too big for the rodent to pick. I'm joking about that. Animals are presented with two bowls, one of which contains food, and they must discriminate based on odor or texture. And because of its similarity, the Wisconsin card sorting test, this task is uh, fully validated. Um, if, or if it was fully validated, it would have good translation to human behavior. Another test that's used is the acoustic startle response and based on evidence schizophrenic individuals can't filter sensory stimuli and overwhelmed by sights, sounds, and odors in the environment. 
a reversal of induced sensory filtering deficits predicts antipsychotic effects. Now, to study neurodevelopment, researchers subject pregnant rodents to inadequate diets, viral infections, stressors that elevate glucocorticoids, or create complications during delivery, such as hypoxia. Um, now, the neonatal ventral hippocampal lesion model demonstrates how a single defect early in life can produce later physiological and behavioral abnormalities reminiscent of schizophrenia. Um, in this test, the ventral um, hippocampus, and, and, and ventral means the underside, the belly of the hippocampus is lesioned um, post at postnatal day seven. And uh, this demonstrates um, the, how the animals, what they find is the animals begin to show behavioral changes in adolescence that reflect symptoms of schizophrenia. And as in humans, negative-like symptoms and cognitive deficits appear early in rodents. And uh, positive-like symptoms occur at a time corresponding to human adolescence or early adulthood, when a, when a human being is more likely to have the um, first break. Now, we do have childhood-onset schizophrenia or psychosis, but typically, again, we find it around adolescence or early adulthood. So... Now, early hippocampal lesions also affect development of other brain areas, including the prefrontal cortex, medial temporal lobe, which means kind of the hippocampi, parahippocampal gyrus, and the nucleus accumbens, which is part of the basal ganglia. And loss of hippocampal input to the prefrontal cortex is probably responsible for the decreased dendritic length and spine density characteristic um, in, in animals. Now, genetic models, um, we also use, okay, you remember knockout mice um, are whenever we knock out a certain genetic sequence to see how it affects behavior and development. We also have knock-in or transgenic mice. Uh, they, they're useful for um, modifying genetic structures in, in genes that seem susceptible in schizophrenia. So... When the gene for the dopamine reuptake transporter is deleted, animals show hyperactivity. Uh, stereotype movements, other behaviors similar to schizophrenic behavior. So we also have the dopamine hypothesis. So we talked about the hypofrontality hypothesis. Um, the dopamine hypothesis looks less at structure and function, more on, on uh, neurochemistry. And what we find is that Excess dopamine function results in positive symptoms of schizophrenia, which is not so surprising because if you think about it, um, individuals um, who take too much methamphetamine oftentimes will exhibit schizophrenic behavior. And it was suggested by the fact that amphetamine can produce psychotic reaction in healthy individuals that can be reversed by dopamine antagonists such as antipsychotic medication. That's oftentimes the treatment if somebody is psychotic from drug abuse, they'll actually give them an antipsychotic medication. But there's a strong correlation between dopamine 2 receptor blockade and reduction of schizophrenic symptoms. But evaluation of dopamine function in patients has, has been inconsistent. Now, the dopamine imbalance hypothesis suggests that symptoms are due to reduce dopamine function in the mesocortical neurons along with excess dopamine function in these neurons. Um, or, I'm sorry, there, that there's uh, reduced dopamine function in mesocortical neurons along with excess dopamine function in mesolimbic. Remember, we actually have um, uh, the nigrostriatal dopaminergic system, the mesolimbic, and the mesocortical. So it seems like reduced dopamine in the mesocortical and the mesolimbic are responsible. So if it was the uh, nigrostriatal, then it would, would be more likely to be a movement disorder. The neurodevelopmental model um, indicates that negative and cog cognitive symptoms are associated with reduced frontal lobe function, again the hypofrontality hypothesis, and excessive mesolimbic dopamine activity following early mesocortical cell loss can explain the positive symptoms. 
early mesocortical cell loss due to genetics or environmental events that alter brain development are followed by loss of inhibitory control of mesolimbic cells and the onset of positive symptoms. And this model can explain many pieces of the puzzle schizophrenia, uh, and it provides a testable hypothesis for further research. Other transmitters may also contribute to symptoms. We talked about the dopamine hypothesis. There's also the glutamate hypothesis. The idea that glutamate and dopamine interact and inadequate glutamate may explain the apparent increase in the mesolimbic dopamine and decrease in the prefrontal cortex. So the descending glutamatergic neurons influence both of these dopaminergic pathways, and maybe that's actually causing a secondary dopaminergic um, dysfunction that's actually leading to the psychotic symptoms. So um, there's a nice diagram just showing the dopaminergic pathways there uh, are, are both green and blue, but if we actually look at the or, or, I'm sorry, they're both uh, black and blue, but the glutamatergic neurons actually regulate both. They're green, and this can actually lead to changes in dopamine functioning throughout the, the brain. Now, descending glutamate neurons excite mesocortical dopamine neurons. Low glutamate would produce low dopamine release in the prefrontal cortex exacerbating negative and cognitive symptoms, and other glutamate neurons excite inhibitory GABA neurons that inhibit the dopamine mesolimbic pathway, and the low glutamate would lead to excess dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens, which would result to in, in positive symptoms, such as delusions and hallucinations. Now, challenge studies show that blocking the NMDA receptors, which are glutamate receptors, with um, PCP, fencyclidine, or ketamine produces psychotic syndrome uh, like schizophrenia in healthy individuals and exacerbates symptoms in schizophrenic patients. But PCP and ketamine both do produce the positive as well as the negative symptoms of schizophrenia, making them useful models for trying to understand the biomarkers. Um, and the um, mechanisms of schizophrenia. But many other lines of evidence support the role of glutamate in its interaction with dopamine and schizophrenia, and many other neurotransmitters may also have a role in individual symptoms. Now, to treat schizophrenia, oftentimes we use antipsychotic drugs, also called neuroleptics. Um, Sometimes I'll say neuroleptics because they're used for all sorts of things, and when people hear antipsychotic, sometimes that can sound like a very judgmental term. But there are many of these drugs, and none are consistently more effective than the others. We had first and second generation. Uh, the second generation were heralded as being more effective, safer, better at treating negative uh, symptoms. Unfortunately, these claims have not withstood scientific uh, scrutiny. They haven't held up so well. But an individual may respond better to one drug than another, and several may have to be tested in order to uh, find the one that's the most effective. But the classic antipsychotic drugs are the phenothiazines and the butrophenones. And uh, the phenothiazines have a three-ring nucleus plus a variable side group, and the, a side chain structure determines their potency, activity, side effects. Um, so here are some uh, promazine, chlorpromazine. Um, good luck pronouncing that third one there. Um, these are different ones that are used. You don't have to know all of these. Each of these has different uh, benefits, um, side effect profiles. But effectiveness of these drugs has been demonstrated hundreds of times, especially for positive symptoms. Um, and the negative and cognitive symptoms are more resistant to treatment. You put somebody with psychosis on medication that treats their hallucinations, it doesn't necessarily improve their executive functioning. They're still going to struggle with uh, the Wisconsin card sorting task and, you know, the other marshmallow tests of life. The law of thirds is, is this idea that has endured in psychiatry that one-third of patients respond well, one-third shows significant improvements, but may relapse and one-third fails to respond.
After initial recovery, antipsychotic drugs are prescribed as maintenance therapy to prevent relapse and unpleasant side effects um, cause many patients to stop treatment. And psychotherapy and group therapy are important additions to drug therapy. And antipsychotic drugs block these D2 receptors, they're antagonists. And a strong correlation exists between ability of a drug to displace uh, radio-labeled ligand and dopamine receptors and uh, average clinical daily dose required. So here's a list of uh, here's uh, concentrations needed to have the same effect for different drugs. As you can see, some are stronger than other. Now the drugs also bind other receptors, but there's no clear relation between clinical effectiveness and binding to serotonin, alpha adrenergic histamine, or dopamine 2 receptors. And the correlation with dopamine 2 receptor binding establishes quite clearly the mechanisms of antipsychotic drug action. So D2 receptors are both postsynaptic receptors and autoreceptors and are located in the basal ganglia, the nucleus accumbens, amygdala, hippocampus, and cerebral cortex. And positron emission technology um, images, PET scans, uh, show replacement of radio labels on striatal dopamine 2 receptors by different antipsychotic drugs. So here's a picture of what these look like. We can see where the binding is actually occurring. Um, but antipsychotics also block these D2 receptors, which control firing rate and synthesis of dopamine. And this inhibition is antagonized by antipsychotics. Increased firing rate after antipsychotic administrations accompanied by increased turnover of dopamine. Um, and chronic blockade with neuroleptics leads to upregulation of the autoreceptors, resulting in regulation of dopamine synthesis, release of metabolism. And uh, after the initial drug-induced increase in dopamine turnover, dopamine cells can temporarily inactivate. We call this a depolarization block. But the time-dependent changes in receptors helps to explain the lag in drug effectiveness. Why is it that it takes a while for the symptoms to go away after the patient takes the drug? Well, it, it seems like this, this uh, time lag can be accounted for by these changes in receptors. Now, under normal conditions, dopamine inhibits prolactin release from the pituitary, and by blocking dopamine 2 receptors, neuroleptics stimulate prolactin secretion, which leads to lactation and breast enlargement, even in males. And measuring serum prolactin provides an easy measure of D2 receptor function uh, in the central nervous system. But the side effects depend partly on which receptor the drug binds to. So here are some different receptors. There are different possible benefits for each receptor. Um, so the four dopamine pathways in the brain are the mesolimbic, mesocortical, nigrostriatal, and there's a fourth one I haven't talked about as much, the tuberohypophyseal pathway, which uh, regulates pituitary hormone secretion. Um, but the mesolimbic pathway is more important for um, the involvement with positive symptoms, whereas mesocortical for cognitive and negative, the nigrostriatal for the motor side effects, um, and then the tuberohypophyseal pathway regulates pituitary hormone secretion and neuroendocrine effects. Now Parkinsonism, so the motor side effects that resemble the symptoms of Parkinson's disease are found oftentimes with uh, schizophrenia, because of the medication, individuals will develop a, a um, syndrome called tardive dyskinesia, which includes a, um, a trembling, a tongue twitching, a puckering of the lips. And, and these individuals will have the symptom. Oftentimes it means that the um, dose of, of antipsychotic medication probably should be lowered if that's not contraindicated by other symptoms. There are also um, treatments that can be used for dealing with the tardive dyskinesia, such as um, ingresia. Um, but Parkinson's is caused by a loss of cell bodies in the substantia nigra, which gives rise to the nigrostriatal 
pathway. And a lack of dopamine function in the striatum increases cholinergic cell activity, which causes the motor effects. So, now Parkinson's disease is treated by reducing excess acetylcholine activity, and neuroleptic drugs that have an anticholinergic action, such as uh, theoridazine, have been developed, and alternatively, antipsychotic drugs are combined with um, anticholinergic drugs, such as uh, cogentin, um, in an attempt to, to manage this. But tardive dyskinesia, which I just talked about, is characterized by stereotyped involuntary movements, particularly of the face and jaw, and quick and uncontrolled movement of the arms and legs and other motor effects. And the incidence of tardive dyskinesia increases with um, duration of treatment. So after um, 25 years of treatment, 68%, uh, the cumulative incidence of tardive dyskinesia goes up to 68%. So we need more drugs that are useful for um, managing these symptoms. Now the neuroendocrine effects include decreased sex drive, loss of menstruation, increased prolactin release, inhibition of growth hormone release, and weight gain and inability to regulate body temperature are problematic side effects for people who are being treated with a neuroleptic medication or antipsychotic medication. Now, neuroleptic malignant syndrome is a serious life-threatening condition characterized by fever, rigidity, altered consciousness, autonomic nervous system instability, and includes rapid heart rate, fluctuations in blood pressure, rapid diagnosis, and immediate action have significantly reduced the mortality risk associated with neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Other side effects of antipsychotics, blocking cholinergic synapses produces dry mouth, blurred vision, difficulty in urination, as well as uh, GI problems. And anti-andrenergic action leads to dizziness, faintness, blacking out. Um, many of these drugs also cause sedation, unfortunately. So here's a really complex chart just showing what different side effects um, each different antipsychotic medication has, as well as the efficacy for various symptoms. Um, this is the sort of thing that a psychiatrist would know without thinking about it practically. This is what they do. Um, very interesting. And to me, this, the whole purpose of this chart is to show you the complexity um, involved in weighing which to use and then you add in, like, is the person, you know, planning on having a child, or is the person somebody who's going to get married and drinks, or is this, you know, how, do their, how does their lifestyle factor in? What other health issues do they have? It's very, very difficult work psychiatrists do. So antipsychotic drugs cause little or no tolerance, physical dependence, or abuse potential, but have high therapeutic index. And um, lack of abstinence syndrome may be due to the long half-life. However, abrupt termination of the drugs may unmask um, signs of tardive dyskinesia. But atypical or second-generation drugs reduce positive symptoms of schizophrenia, as well as classical drugs, but without significant extrapyramidal side effects. And some new drugs do not produce tardive dyskinesia or increased prolactin secretion. Now, selective D2 receptor antagonists have a high affinity for D2 receptors and slight affinity for D3 receptors as well. Um, and the effects of the um, autonomic nervous system and cardiovascular system are mild but hormonal side effects and risk of fatal blood disorders reduces their utility. So here's some other uh, affinities involved with antipsychotics. Um, now the dopamine system stabilizers are partial dopamine agonists that compete with dopamine for receptors and reduce dopamine effects. Um, for instance, you've probably heard of Abilify. It's the prototype drug. It has few side effects. Um, this is one of the reasons that it tends to be prescribed a lot. 
Now, broad-spectrum antipsychotics block other receptor types in addition to D2 receptors, like clozapine has weak affinities for D1 and D2, as well as strong affinities for serotonergic, muscarinic, histaminergic, and D4 receptors. So it's more effective for patients who do not respond to the first-line typical neuroleptic drugs. Now, clozapine has many side effects because of its action on multiple receptors. There's little evidence to suggest superiority of the atypical drugs over conventional antipsychotics, although they do appear to reduce motor side effects, um, such as the extrapyramidal side effects. Um, now, a practical clinical trial using 1,500 patients under real-world conditions showed atypical drugs were no more effective than classical um, phenothiazines in reducing positive, negative, or cognitive symptoms. And uh, the occurrence of EPS was similar for all, all drugs. So similar work in the United Kingdom found similar results, except clozapine was superior. And it would seem that only clozapine is truly atypical. So these uh, findings should encourage use of older first-generation drugs which are effective at significantly lower cost to, to the patients. So, now neither first or second generation antipsychotic drugs improve cognitive impairments of schizophrenia, but some new approaches are enhancing acetylcholine. Um, clozapine is the only drug currently in use that enhances cognition. It increases acetylcholine re release in the hippocampus. Um, it selectively enhances D1-2 receptor signaling in the prefrontal cortex with D1 agonists. Um, and hypofrontality is associated with reduced dopamine function in the prefrontal cortex, especially dopamine 1 receptors. And alternatively, increased dopamine function by inhibiting the um, enzyme compt catechol O methyltransferase, which breaks up dopamine, it degrades, uh, uh, the comp degrades dopamine in the synapses, um, but if you inhibit it, it leads to more dopamine. So in comp knockout mice, dopamine levels are increased in the prefrontal cortex where there are fewer reuptake transporters, but not in the striatum, and performance on memory tasks is improved. Now, uh, talcapone inhibits comp and shows promise in some research, but it can produce serious liver dysfunction, which requires frequent liver enzyme testing. Another approach is enhancing glutamate activity at NMDA receptors. Again, we talked about the glutamate model for schizophrenia, how glutamate helps regulate dopamine levels um, in the um, tegmental uh, cortical and um, uh, limbic systems, um, but enhancing glutamate activity at these NMDA receptors might reverse negative and cognitive symptoms, and low glutamate signaling could explain the decrease in this mesocortical activity that's believed to cause the negative as well as the cognitive symptoms. Glycine site agonists also can be used to enhance NMDA signaling because Glycine is an obligatory coagonist at this receptor, but glycine receptor agonists have mixed results in clinical trials, and glycine transporter inhibitors show wins. Glycine site agonists also can be used to enhance NMDA signaling because glycine is an obligatory coagonist at this receptor, but glycine receptor agonists have mixed results in clinical trials, and glycine transporter inhibitors show more promise. So I know that's a lot, but now you can say you, you've learned what there is to know about the mechanisms behind schizophrenia, the mechanisms behind antipsychotic medications, and what sorts of treatments are going to be utilized in the future. I want to thank you for taking the time to 
watch this lecture and learn from this lecture. This is going to be our final lecture for this class. I, I want to thank you. Um, I hope that this was a rewarding class. I, I sincerely appreciate your patience. I know that, that this has been a lot of work and there have been a lot of changes. and um, <laughs> We're always a computer problem away from a one-week delay. And, um, and that's one of the reasons we're not going to have our final presentation on, uh, uh, on uh, uh, neurological disorders. Uh, but I want to thank you for your patience, for your courage in taking this class. And uh, next week, you're going to have a week to take your um, exam. And hopefully you can study before then. And hopefully you have a wonderful holiday because I, kn I, know, I know you deserve it. It's been quite a semester. So thank you very much and have a wonderful holiday.